Susan Feinstein, thanks so much for taking your time for this talk, for coming over to Zurich anyways. For it's a pleasure. <laughs> um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, you wrote the much noted book, The Just City, uh, appearing in 2010. What triggered your interest to engage with social justice in well, the city? I, I have always, since I was an undergraduate, been concerned with issues of social justice, but it more crystallized in my mind at a um, conference in 19, I think it was 1993, um, which was in celebration of the anniversary of the publication of David Harvey's book, uh, Social Justice in the City. I wrote a paper for that conference, and then I kept thinking about how could we frame the question of social justice for people who actually were policy makers in the city. Uh, what would they do, and what criteria should they use uh, in order to decide what were policies that made a more just city? Uh, so I spent a lot of time after that uh, reading philosophy. Uh, I had studied uh, political science as an undergraduate and as a graduate student and had read political theory, but I hadn't read um, what was called philosophy per se uh, in terms of theories of justice. Uh, I then actually took a course by being taught by an eminent German philosopher who was teaching as a visiting professor in New York uh, that year in theories of justice, and I studied uh, some of the classic works and some of the more recent ones uh, in order to first formulate a theory of what would be called urban justice, and then to look at particular cases of urban development in relationship to uh, this theory of urban justice, and then finally to list policies at the city level uh, that would further justice in the city. When you think of the just city, how would you describe it? How, how is it to live in a just city? How does it feel? Uh, well, I'm not sure anybody lives in a just city, uh, but there are certainly cities more just than others. And much of the reason why I studied uh, cities in comparison with each other uh, was to try to figure out which cities were more just. Uh, I spent considerable time in Amsterdam, uh, which um, one of my students uh, had suggested was perhaps the most just city in Europe. Uh, so while living there, I thought it, I thought it was certainly uh, more just than any of the American cities I had experienced. And maybe, along with Vienna and Stockholm, uh, the most just city in Europe. Uh, so I, you know, I looked at particularly policies around housing and transportation uh, and the tolerance of groups that were different uh, in order to evaluate these cities uh, and to uh, then try to figure out which policies they had uh, that produced uh, greater justice. Uh, your, your work has been criticized or described as utopian thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, are your ideas relevant for planning practice? Well, I don't think that uh, they are utopian. Uh, rather, I think that they uh, simply are devoted to saying this would make things better, uh, and that there's always a better and a worse. Uh, the three principles I had were democracy, diversity, or uh, philosophers would use the term recognition, uh, and equity. And I put a priority on equity. Uh, then I tried to find what actual practical policies uh, would further these three principles. So I don't think uh, that it was utopian. I think it was more um, ways of finding practical methods of striving, perhaps, for utopia, and having a utopia that you might use as a measure to see how far you've gotten, uh, but not utopia per se. Uh, the term non-reformist reforms uh, was coined, I think, by Andre Gortz, uh, but used also by Nancy Fraser, 
and this refers to transformational practices uh, which are still reform rather than revolution. In your book, you define equity, diversity, and democracy as dimensions of social justice, while emphasizing potential tensions between the three mm. dimensions. In the field of urban planning, where do you observe tensions between equity and diversity on the one hand side and democracy on the other hand side? Okay, uh, democracy, which I think is a goal in itself because uh, one of the philosophers I cite uh, is um, Amartya Sen and Martha Nussbaum, uh, who developed the argument that uh, what one should strive for is uh, people achieving their potential, they call it capabilities. And uh, to have full capabilities, you have to feel that you've participated in governance. <clears throat> so democracy gives you ownership of governance, and it gives the government legitimacy because people actually uh, voted for it or participated in it. But the problem with democracy is that uh, people, and often the majority of people, don't honor the other two values of diversity and uh, equity. Uh, in particular, when you're talking about planning issues, uh, the people who are homeowners and have their private equity invested in their house tend to be exclusionary, that rather than wanting people who are different from them, or certainly wanting, not wanting people who are poorer than they are, uh, because they fear that this will lower the value of their property. Uh, so we have uh, homeowners associations, uh, which are in a sense democratic and participatory, uh, but they also uh, can be very strongly anti-diversity. Anti-diversity can be discriminatory, uh, may not be at all concerned about issues of equity. Uh, so um, uh, democracy in itself is a value, uh, but democratic uh, participation may lead to decisions which are illiberal. We have, in fact, right now in the world many examples of illiberal democracies. Uh, we can see that uh, people are often, besides their concern about their self-interest, uh, that they can follow demagogues, uh, that they can get uh, very excited over uh, what they see as threats to their culture. Uh, that generally, uh, as a planning issue, we find that people don't want any change in their neighborhood, uh, whether that means changing the housing stock or changing uh, the transportation or changing anything, uh, so that um, Achieving non-reformist reforms may be extremely difficult if you actually have democratic participation. Uh, there tends to be, and this especially the case among my students who were studying to be planners, a kind of reflexive view that what they should do is just, quote, let the people decide, have participation, and then the people will come up with uh, the appropriate policies. Uh, but um, the people often don't come up with policies that achieve greater equity or achieve greater diversity. So I see these, the relationship between these principles as being problematic and also context dependent. Uh, so that there are some places that really require much greater democracy, but other places where suppressing democracy and having progressive leadership would be a lot better. So it depends. In your book, you regard homogeneous neighborhoods as compatible with social justice dimensions as long as the boundaries remain porous. Mm -hmm. Yet research on neighborhood effects um, shows that concentrations of disadvantaged people lead to additional, additional disadvantage on top on, of individual disadvantage. Uh, in schools, professional careers, dependency on social care, violence, and so on, uh, leading to persisting structural disadvantage at the sa uh, of the same population groups. Shouldn't spatial planning and housing policies proactively work against existing levels of segregation? 
Well, certainly if segregation is based on discrimination, saying that people are going to be there in the ghettos because we're not going to let them move anywhere else, then I, that would be very contrary to the principle of diversity. But, and then it depends on the particular group of disadvantaged people and the context in which they're located. Uh, so, for example, the United States has been very good, I think much better than European countries, at absorbing immigrants. That there's always very big prejudice against the newest arriving group, but that eventually these groups become absorbed into the general population. Uh, so right now we hear a great deal in the United States about um, people of color, and that includes African Americans and uh, Latinos. And I would argue the situations of these two groups are quite different, and that for Latinos, when they first come living with others who speak their language uh, and provide the, the kinds of foods they like and provide jobs for them uh, in ethnic businesses, uh, can be greatly to their advantage. And what you see in ethnic neighborhoods are a lot of small businesses uh, that can only thrive if there is, in fact, a um, uh, confluence of congregation of, of these kinds of people. Uh, if you look at the history of Italians going into America, uh, Italians were completely despised initially. Uh, but Italians are now simply part of the American public and nobody thinks anything particularly negative about them and they've all lost their language actually. Uh, but it took a couple of generations. So I think for one thing it depends on the recency of immigration. Uh, another, I guess, depends on the willingness of the group to uh, assimilate. Uh, Asians in the United States have the highest median income of any identifiable group higher than whites. And uh, some of it is because people come who already have professional status, but the other is that uh, within Chinatowns, particularly, uh, there's a good deal of social capital gathered, uh, which people can take advantage of. Now, when you're talking about, in the United States, ghettos of African Americans who are descended from slaves, or if you're talking in Britain actually about Pakistanis who seem to get, have a lower status in Britain than do, uh, say, black Caribbeans, that these groups are often ghettoized simply because they're discriminated against. And uh, at the same time, they don't uh, necessarily have advantages. Now, I know one of the points that you've raised before is about schools. And it's a huge issue of school segregation. But what actually happens when you have integration of schools is that one of the things that happens if parents who are the main, uh, the dominant class, feel that their children are getting worse education because of exposure to people who come from much less educated backgrounds, they will pull their children out of their school, those schools. They will move or they will put them in private schools or they will do something to avoid it. And that um, there's no, no real evidence that coming into contact with others who are different actually makes people more tolerant of them. It depends on how the contact works. Uh, so um, when my children started school, uh, which was in a working class area, a couple of the kids in the school basically shook them down for their lunch money. Uh, so uh, <laughs> that was not a good situation and it didn't lead to people feeling better about these others in the school. Uh, the, Kids who grew up in communities where there is criminality don't leave that behind necessarily because they leave that community. And this isn't tied to particular groups, it's rather tied to having a background of, um, of family life that's non-supportive of education, of um, insecurity, of a lot of, of having uh, role models who uh, make their uh, money from uh, uh, unapproved practices, but that simply putting people together without providing a framework in which 
those people who are disadvantaged are not still economically disadvantaged uh, is not going to solve any of their problems nor necessarily make them uh, do better in school. Now one of the things that a lot of European countries do, of which Swiss, Switzerland is one, Germany is another, is that they have exams which then sort people out when they reach the age, reach the age of being teenagers. So that, uh, and New York for that matter has examination schools also, so that you can be living in the same area uh, but you're going either to a different school or within the school that you're in, uh, students are tracked. Uh, so there are the, in, when in um, the United States, they're called AP classes, or which stands for advanced placement. Uh, so that in school districts, which are very heterogeneous, uh, it turns out that the AP classes uh, tend to be drawn from the majority group. And so the minority children are not segregated by virtue of their color or their ethnicity or their language, they're sorted by how they did on a test that um, determines which class in the school they're going to be in. Mm -hmm. um, I think in, in, in New York, in the school district, uh, there have been like over decades efforts by even by white parents to have m more mixed schools, so bottom-up initiatives. Mm -hmm. Uh, which in the end never succeeded, but there's a new, um, like a new movement for more equitable schools. I think people are more aware. They say they they hear about segregation, um, and and now they start thinking about do they want to be part of the segregation process? So not taking kind of in, individual steps to counter segregation, but try to organize and find systematic solutions at the district level, for example? Well, I wrote my doctoral dissertation in the late 1960s, at which time progressive parents, white parents, were calling for desegregation of the schools and for community control and for parents participating. I, precipitated a citywide school strike by teachers. Uh, eventually, they set up a sort of district system of uh, schools, uh, but it then sort of all devolved back to being the same thing as was. Right now, uh, there's a big controversy in Brooklyn over desegregation of, or redrawing the school districts. And there are those who support it, and there are those who vehemently oppose it. Uh, and this is the case uh, in Montgomery County, uh, uh, Maryland. Uh, likewise, uh, there I, in fact, have co-authored a paper with a fellow who's the planner in charge of redrawing the districts there. And uh, there is enormous opposition to it as well as support for it. And that there's certainly no consensus mm -hmm. that, that comes out of it. Okay, coming coming back to the topic of housing, uh, you recently did research on the strongly regulated housing system in Singapore. Mm. Uh, while quotas for ethnic groups are intended for uh, in order to strengthen social integration, you found that such regulation also suppressed private initiative and led to the isolation of minorities. Uh, can you explain this? Well, not a to the isolation bit? of minorities. Um, Singapore has something called the ethnic integration policy, and all public housing buildings uh, have to have uh, residents in proportion to their proportion of the population. And 80% of citizens of Singapore live in public housing, so uh, you can live in it up to a very high income and you don't have to leave if your income goes over the, whatever the limit is, which is very high. So almost everybody in Singapore lives in what they call HDB, which stands for Housing Development Board Housing. Uh, so, uh, and in terms of schools, uh, they are in school in the same proportion as they are in the general population, which is 72% Chinese, 17% uh, Malay, and 7% Indian. And so every school breaks down like this, pretty much. And every housing block breaks down like this. 
And so there certainly isn't isolation, uh, but there's isolation in the sense that the adults in the different groups don't socialize with each other much. But the kids do go to school and they socialize on the playground, and parents may even socialize on the playground. Uh, Singapore has vast amounts of green space. Uh, it's very committed to um, uh, ecology. Uh, it's uh, an extremely well-planned place, and it maximizes diversity in the sense of requiring it. So uh, it doesn't have isolation. It maximizes diversity. It, it's difficult to say whether it provides equity uh, in that if you look at the Gini coefficient, that is the measure of income inequality, there's quite high income inequality. But so much is provided by the public sector and is out of the market that there's nobody who's destitute in Singapore. Uh, if you're very poor, you get um, well, the housing system's complicated, but if you're very poor, you get very cheap rental housing. But for most, and that's about 5% of the population, but everybody else actually owns their unit within public housing. So it's condominiumized public housing. But almost all the land in Singapore is owned by the government, so there's no market in land. And because there's no market in land, there's no price of land that gets built into the price of housing. Uh, there are locations that are more desirable than others, but aside from that, it doesn't have a phenomenon that you might call gentrification. Uh, it doesn't have slums, period. There are no slums. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, from many perspectives, it's a wonderful place. Democracy is virtually non-existent. Okay. And so I would say that what Singapore needs is more democracy and people having more of a feeling that they're part of the government or the governance of the place rather than being so totally passive uh, as they are. What do you think of the French approach to tackling segregation? Municipalities with more than 3,500 inhabitants are to reach a minimum of 25% social housing. Uh, the Metropolitan Government of Lyon has recently introduced social mixing zones in more than half of its municipalities. Well, the French refuse to recognize difference. And I guess there's also a question which is often raised uh, in countries that have had a large amount of uh, Muslim uh, immigrants. Uh, well, these are cultural groups that suppress women and keep them in the house and won't let them be educated and so forth, and so it's up to the government to change that. And that's very much an attitude that exists in France. Um, I don't know, <laughs> because forcing people to give up their culture, even though I'm totally opposed to Islamic uh, rules about women, uh, but I don't know that you can force people to give up their culture without a huge cost uh, in terms of the legitimacy of the government. Uh, a parallel example is actually uh, in New York, uh, the ultra-Orthodox Jews who impose similar restraints on their women, who uh, keep, and it's true actually in Israel too, uh, the ultra-Orthodox not only keep women oppressed and suppressed, uh, but they allow men to get out of work if they're studying Talmud. And so, um, and in Israel they get out of the military. And so when you have cultures that are that strong and that restrictive, uh, it's hard to say what the government should do, but it would certainly be better if reformers within them attempted reform rather than it being from the top down. And this is why France, when it says we well, girls can't wear headscarves, uh, that this just produces resistance rather than uh, going along with it. Um, if you have social mix, but the people have contempt for each other, then social mix isn't going to do much. Mm -hmm. The city of Zurich aims to raise its share of non-profit housing from 25 to 33 percentage by 2050. 
and the city also aims for mixed neighborhoods. Since non-profit housing estates often strive for inhabitants to represent a wide income range, they do not only contribute to social mixing within their estates, but often also in relation to their neighborhood. How would you judge such a system where housing associations would strive to make better use of their mixing potential within the limits of what seems acceptable to their residents? I think that's wonderful if they can do it by all means. I see there's a big difference between voluntary social mixing and involuntary social mixing. Uh, and if you're producing new housing that people want to be in, you're going to get voluntary social mixing because everybody's going to want to be in it. Mm. Uh, it's when you say, oh, well, uh, this is a ghetto which needs to be broken up, so we'll just displace the people in it whether they want to go or not, uh, that you have a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, so democracy may mean participation in government, but democracy also really means giving people choices rather than saying, well, for the greater good, you'd better do this. Your talk today was exploring the role of right-wing populism working against planning of just cities. In our case studies, we feel that just city planning is hindered by diffuse fears of social mixing in the majoritarian society and parts of the administrations, even in cities governed by the left. Would you qualify this as some kind of populism as well? Uh, well, yes, and uh, I talk about, um, I've talked about in my lecture uh, that uh, in communities like the one in which I live in Connecticut, uh, which is a town, it's only 30,000 people, but in terms of income it's very diverse. It has everything from really low-income people who get welfare uh, and live in uh, mobile homes uh, to people who have mansions that are worth you know, three, four, five million dollars. Mm -hmm. And it has industry and it has retail and it's a very diverse community in the, in the way that planners set up as a kind of ideal, but uh, it has very small percentage of African Americans, two percent, even though it's in the New Haven area where there's a substantial black population. And it has probably, you know, and it has other ethnic groups like Hispanics and Asians for another maybe two, three percent. And so it's something like 95 percent white. Although a substantial Italian population, because that was kind of the original group there. Uh, but uh, when there was an attempt to enlarge, it has public housing, but the public housing is had been restricted to senior citizens and disabled. Well, uh, the city engineer declared that the housing was so decrepit that it had to be torn down and replaced, and they got federal money to do it, but the federal rules associated with it said that they had to let in families. Well, you would think the end of the world had come, that there were people ranting at the public meetings, there was um, uh, and a successful attempt to get rid of the head of the housing authority uh, because she had said, well, we have to go. She didn't say she wanted to do this, but she uh, felt that it had to be done. And the fear was that African Americans would be allowed to be the families in the family housing. And so you have, even in a liberal city, uh, a great deal of antagonism to um, to people who are different, who, or who they see as threatening their way of life, or who they see as potentially dangerous. I mean, you watch the news on television, and there's an old saying that if it leads, it leads, so you see these pictures you know, of black people being uh, shot and doing the shooting, and so they think they don't want that in their neighborhood. Now, it doesn't mean that the people who would move in would be anything like that, mm -hmm. but that's the stereotype they have, and they mobilize, and they are hot-headed, and they scream in public meetings. And it, they may not be a majority, they certainly aren't a majority, but they are, effect, they are a populist group which are effective, effective enough 
to scare the politicians completely. So against this background of national populism and maybe populism bottom-up mm -hmm. uh, resistance to just city policies, do you nonetheless see any signs of hope for more socially oriented urban planning in the future? Yes. Well, for one thing, I think that people who become planners tend to be progressive. I think they can influence the politics by uh, creating plans which um, politicians will support and which will get backing and which don't necessarily involve, um, as this did, enlarging public housing, but, for example, increasing densities so that people who maybe aren't the poorest, but nevertheless are people who are different, can simply move in. Um, that um, one of the plans, while well, in the same town, Branford, involved uh, densification around the uh, train station. And this has been resisted too, because people are terrified of higher densities because they think it will, quote, change the character of their community, but there are plenty of people who support it. And that uh, if you're not being explicit about saying we're going to move in people who you're not going to like, uh, once it's built there's not much that the populist um, uh, people who are afraid of anybody different can do about it. And so uh, there are different kinds of planning approaches uh, that can in fact change things. In fact, just going back to the train station, the train station previously you could only board the trains from one side and not that many trains stopped there, but once they improved the train station and you could board from two tracks instead of just from one, there was more service. And once there's more service, it means that more people can in fact take the train to work. And it also means once they do actually build denser around the train station, uh, that a more heterogeneous, a more mixed population will move in and they will not uh, drive their cars, but will in fact use the trains. Uh, and so you will have a, a city that provides, a town that provides more equity and probably more diversity too. Uh, so there are different strategic approaches uh, that can be followed, uh, which are non-reformist reforms, uh, which uh, don't necessarily provoke such uh, strong populist resistance. But I do think that populism is a threat and that we've seen it virtually immobilizing countries at this point, including my own, uh, that um, people, uh, who, people who define themselves as the people think that everybody else represents, you know, isn't the real people and should be ignored or disqualified or whatever. Uh, so, and we had, you know, an attempted coup uh, in Washington. Uh, so we're talking about people who can be violent, who are very angry, and who other people who may be even a majority, or to quote Richard Nixon, a silent majority, uh, are too intimidated to want to stand up to them. So it depends on having a progressive counterforce to the populist force. But it also, I think, depends on having, there was once a book called Guerrillas in the Bureaucracy, uh, which referred to people who were within the government who in a kind of silent way uh, could make things better. Mm 